Hi, everybody. Happy Monday. I know there is no such a thing as happy Monday unless, unless you are uh, in my position where you have Monday off or in my friend Christina's position where she is in spring break. So in that case, it's a happy Monday, but still, it's happy because we're here, because you're here, and we are super excited about this session today, and I know I'm kind of like, I don't know, like freezing a little bit, so just hang in there with me, it's coming along, I don't know what happened with my Wi-Fi, just be patient, but uh, today we are talking about building competency and confidence before the IB exams, but I think anything that we talk today is going to apply for any upper levels but before we start i would love for you to let us know where you are uh, and if you are in spring break or if you had class today and also what you teach in the meantime i'm going to introduce myself if you don't know me i'm claudia elliot i am a spanish teacher in jacksonville florida and i just love to really have a different approach to my classes that are really acquisition driven where I focus about scaffolding a lot of input for my students, scaffolding output, and providing opportunities for any student to be successful in my class, regardless of the level. AP, IB, it's, it's good. We can do that. And with me is my incredible friend, Christina, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Nice to hang out with you here. Thank you, Claudia, for having me. Um, my name is Christina Majori. I am a secondary Spanish teacher. Um, I live and work on Long Island, New York. Um, I've been teaching Spanish since 2009. So I say secondary because this year I'm teaching middle school and high school, which is a little bit of a change for me. I usually just teach high school. Um, and I've been teaching IB Spanish for the past 10 years. Um, so I have a lot of the upper level classes, a lot of um, four conversations, five conversations, which are juniors and seniors that are non-IB. And I also have the IB seniors this year. I have HL, SL, and AP Spanish all in one class. So <laughs> that's always fun. Um, but as Claudia said, I am also really passionate about talking about the IB exam, about these upper level classes, because it's something that I've done for the last few years, so I'm pretty comfortable with it. Um, for me, I'm really passionate about supporting my students to produce more Spanish, because at those upper levels, that's, you know, that is important. It's important to hear them speaking back to me in Spanish. It's important to see what they can produce when they have, when it's their turn to write. Um, if you're not familiar with the IB exam, they have to speak for 12 to 15 minutes in Spanish. So it's a big part of the course, even if they have to, you know, take the AP exam or not AP or not IB at the upper level, they really should be producing. So I'm really passionate about supporting them with activities, coming up with different types of supports um, for my classes and really just bringing fun and keeping fun in the language classroom. Um, those are the things I'm passionate about. So I'm really excited to be here to chat with Claudia about how we can build competence. But more importantly, I think to me is building students confidence before the exam. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about that. And, and, I, and I think you made so many great points uh, because there is this um, mindset about upper levels. Uh, and who should be in and our upper level classes and what we should be doing in class in upper levels. And I think some my sense as, and some ways how we approach that class, what we're doing is we're really limiting the access of these upper level classes. So I know it's challenging, but I think when we come to IB classes, AP classes, uh, just all these upper level classes, we can just have a mindset where we don't we're not building confidence confidence because we are focusing so much on the competency part so we want the the critical thinking for comprehension we want the uh, writing the productive skills like really sharp because they are upper level classes and when we focus on that we just forget the second c which is the confidence aspect and I think that is the one who is going to bring you more engagement, more self-motivation, and at the end, it's going to make you 
your life so much easier because your students will be willing to do so much more if they feel with the confidence that they can do it. It is, I mean, I just didn't believe it until I see it. <laughs> I saw it. But when I saw it, I'm like, oh my gosh, they really, I mean, regardless of the level, bringing that aspect is huge. So we're excited to have you today. And I think we already tell you, told you a little bit about us. Uh, again, my name is Claudia Elliott, and I'm here with Cristina. I teach uh, AP Spanish, and I teach the junior. So I teach Spanish 3 IB. I love to talk to Cristina because Cristina takes them to the test day. I don't, but I always build to that. My students, my Spanish 3 IB students, are taking an end of course exam in my district. So they're also going to be taking an upper level exam, but it's not the IB exam. However, I do the same thing. So even if you're not an IB teacher, I think what we're going to be talking today is going to apply to any level, really. Anybody who has to do that. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about how to build confidence, confidence in a students, an activity to try before the exam. And then we're going to open it for you to ask us questions. So let's start. Oh, that was a good one, huh, Christina? <laughs> yes. So um, if you didn't get a chance to get this, we shared this, uh, I think it was last week. Claudia and I met and we were chatting and I had said to her that I was um, doing something on my own unrelated to teaching. And I really liked how this course I was taking gave us like a challenge sheet. Um, I really liked it. I liked the style of it. So I said to her, hey, wouldn't this be really cool if we made something like this for our classes? And of course, she was jumped right in, you know, with me. And I mean, this took us maybe like 15 minutes, not even we just kind of threw together, you know, both use our brains and we kind of just threw together our list of favorite resources and we created this um, student checklist. So there's a couple of different ways you can use it. And I'm going to also drop the link in the chat or whatever this is called on Facebook in the comments. I'm going to put the link here in case you didn't get it. Um, but yeah, so it's a checklist with three kind of language booster challenges at the top. So we encourage students to choose one of those followed by four tasks on the bottom that they should complete all of them and a space for them to write down any questions that they have that they want to follow up with you on. So the way I approached it is, as Claudia mentioned at the beginning, I'm on spring break this week um, in the Northeast, or at least where I am in New York. Um, we have a February break for President's Week, and then we've had a very long stretch of about eight weeks now until spring break. So we are off this week. So, before, you know, for us, we started on Thursday. So head off Thursday, Friday, and this week, which is wonderful. But as you're getting closer to the exam, for me, it's not so great to miss your students for 11 days because uh, almost all of my students do not have someone at home who they can practice Spanish with. So I really fear that they're going to lose, um, you know, just having it fresh in their brain so close to the exam. So we created this, I gave it to them right before break and I made it optional because for us, uh, most of our students do celebrate uh, the religious holidays this week and i personally don't love to give work over a religious holiday I, it just you know is a little bit conflicting so i gave it to them and i said hey guys here this here is a list of things you can do over break to keep spanish fresh in your brain i went over you know why it's so important to do that when we come back because we're coming back at the last week of april most of them are taking IB and ap exams starting when we come back so they're in and out of my class. You know, some days I go to class, I have three kids because so many of them are taking an exam. So it's really important for us to use our time. So I gave it to them. I challenged them to do this over break. I said it was optional. But something else you could do is give it to your students. And as a class, you know, give yourself 15 minutes a day for five days or so. Um, and just say, okay, guys, take out your challenge sheets. You've got 15 minutes to work on this. I mean, it's kind of a great thing. It's the lessons you're planning a little bit to just give to them and say, we have 15 minutes, choose one of the challenge tasks or choose a language booster and work on it right now. And it can work individually, or you can have them complete it as a class, give them choice and activity. All right. Whoever's working on a language booster, you can come over here. If you're working on challenge task one, go over here, challenge task two over here and allow them to form these small groups to support each other. There's really no wrong way to do this. And it's kind of 
open to your interpretation. But we were just thoughtful when we made this to try to include a little bit of listening for the audio part of the exam. Um, some writing opportunities for students to practice writing a little bit. We purposely chose a past tense writing and a future tense writing. Um, we also look for some readings where students can go and answer questions and get their answers graded right there. So they just get that practice. So that's what we have for you. If you didn't get it, I highly recommend grabbing it. Um, and then please let us know how you're using it. We'd love to see, you know, pictures. You can tag us. You can share here. We'd love to see how you guys are using it in your classes. Now, I also love to use this for small groups. And Christina mentioned that. The, this is going to allow you to create four group, uh, small groups. You can put a timer. I like to put a timer. Uh, and I say, you know, when we fi we're finishing the timer, it's just if you didn't get it to complete, that's okay. So you put a 15 minutes timer or a 20 minutes timer, and then you divide your class. Uh, usually the upper level classes are not huge. Mine's, mine, uh, mine are kind of like, yeah, I have one big. But anyway, you can, you can put them in small groups. It can be four groups. One is going to do one of the, the, free, the three tasks at the beginning. And then you meet with the fourth one. And then you choose something that you see the class is struggling a little bit. It can be, you don't know, like, okay, so students in IB are really kind of stressed out about uh, the type of text or the audience. So you meet with a small group and tackle that. So that is going to be much better. And if you have a 90 minutes class, Imagine you can see all your small groups and get a small one, I mean, kind of like a small group discussion, much better. I got that idea from Anna Marie Chase. She is doing that with his Spanish one and she puts a timer. I did it with my Spanish three IB because we were talking about the poem of Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, Hombres Necios. And at the end, I have my students to do a survey and I ask them what activity really help you. And then, all, I mean, like 80% of my students said small group discussions because you can really support them better. So look how many choices you have. This is like a great way to do stations, right? And they're already there. And like Christina said, if you look at them, they're really helping with competency but they build confidence because they're doable. <laughs> you are not doing, oh, read a BBC article and summarize it and do an essay, right? Because when is that, is they're gonna be cheating, they're gonna be doing Google Translator. It's just so above their level, but this is something that is like, okay, listen to this podcast and tell me what you understood. Or do lyrics training and just listen to this and, and keep a competition and keep it really doable. So I really think this checklist can help you in the next three weeks. And you can add whatever they need because I don't know if we you see the last, the last part where you have students to say, what do you need to work on? So that part is like you can really get students to give you some feedback about what they need to be working on. Um, so now we're just gonna chat a little bit about building that confidence. So, you know, as Claudia said, building competency through different activities, but what happens when your students are trying these activities and they're growing increasingly frustrated? Um, how do we react? What do we do? So again, I teach the level, we call it IB year two. So I have seniors, I have SL, HL, and AP Spanish all in one class. So I have a lot of, you know, students who are high achievers and they feel a lot of pressure, you know, colleges, getting college credit. They want to go to a good school. They want, they need to get this score on the exam and they put a lot of pressure on themselves. It's not something that I necessarily put on them. I really don't say like the test is so important. You have to do, um, you have to get this. It, this means you're good at Spanish. Absolutely not. But they feel a lot of pressure from parents, from community, and just, you know, being high achievers. Most of our IB or AP students are used to doing really well in most of their classes. And then they get to, you know, IB practice exams or they, you give them an old exam 
and they're scoring like 50% and we're trying to tell them that 50% is actually pretty good. And they look at you like you're speaking in a completely different language or that you're crazy. Um, so that's, you know, that's a big battle that we all have to face. So I think for me, what I've found in the last few years is I really try to do these three things with my students. And I think this really sets them up for success because at the end of the day, feeling confident walking into an exam, walking into any type of situation is going to help you be more successful. You know, you ever heard the saying, fake it until you make it, right? It's not always about knowing everything. It's not always about having all the answers. It's about walking in there confidently and just putting your best stuff out there and seeing how it goes. So the first thing is to have clear expectations. You have Your students have to know what they're walking into. I tell them probably a million times, this is what you're doing on day one. This is what you're doing on day two. This is what the individual oral will look like. I mean, we talked about the individual oral so much before it happened that when they got there, were they nervous because it was a testing situation? Absolutely. Did one, did any student have no clue what was going on? Absolutely not. Because we practiced it so many times. I told them so many times, you're going to walk into the room. You're going, I'm going to be sitting there. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. I walk them through it step by step by step so that all of the nerves of what's happening next, what's going on, do I need to move? Do I need to go somewhere? All of that's gone because they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. So now they can focus on the task at hand. So even you know, moving forward to your exam, where is the testing location? What are they expected to do on day one? What does paper one look like? What does that mean? Right, you know, writing, what kind of writing? How many? How many choices will they have? What will they have to do? What about the reading? What does the reading look like? What types of questions will they see? They need to know all of this before the exam. Because if not, they're going to be totally lost because not only are they struggling with words they don't know in Spanish, now they're struggling with a test they have no idea how to take. And that's really a huge struggle. So with that ties in number two of practice questions. I think it is so important to weave in old IB exams into your teaching as often as possible. Is it the most exciting thing to do in the world? No. But at the end of the day, that's what our students have to do. So we have to find a way to kind of bring that to them. So again, the more they see those reading um, reading comprehension questions, the more comfortable they are. The first time they do a true false justify, you know, like little things, they say, do I have to justify it if it's true? And they do, but on many other tests, they don't. So those little questions, you're going, they're going to know, you must always justify. Sometimes on the IB exam, they put a little box for students to put the multiple choice answer or for them to put a letter answer. You know how many students skip that because they just circle it and then they keep going? And you say to them, if you put nothing in the box, you've omitted the question. I mean, these are all little things that with practice, they will get. And all of those things make them feel so much more comfortable because at the end of the day, when they open that exam and they see familiar questions, they're already like, okay, I've seen this before. That boosts their confidence. Okay. This is the writing. I see three choices. I know what I have to do. That boosts their confidence. They feel more confident, more confident, more confident. And number three, I think is really important. I try to set this expectation on day one. And I remind them constantly, they have to be uncomfortable with not knowing things. Again, I'm talking to, you know, the high achievers in the school. Your IB, AP kids are your students who want to challenge something. They, have, they are used to knowing everything. They are used to doing really well in Spanish. You know, manzana is apple is so easy to them. But now when it's find the synonym or find the word that means this or what does le refer to in this text, you know, these questions where they really have to think about it or challenging vocabulary and they don't know, they panic because when they feel like they don't know, they feel like I can't do this. I don't know. I can't do this. That's the immediate connection. So if you set them up with, listen, you are going to see things you do not know. I'm telling you right now, that doesn't mean that you're a bad student. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad teacher and I didn't teach you everything. It is impossible for us to cover everything that's going to be on that exam. I mean, think about all the years we've seen texts from, you know, different countries and there's different vocabulary. There's words that we don't usually focus on or teach or whatever it is. 
there's going to be things they don't know and they have to be comfortable with that. And they have to know that, okay, I don't know this, but I know enough. I know enough to do my best and get past it. And if they can accept that, if they know what they're doing, if they know what the questions look like, and if they can accept that there's going to be things they don't know and that's okay, they are going to be confident on that exam. And that's really half the battle. I have to agree with you in all what you said, Christina. And, you know, when you were talking about practicing questions that they are not too fun. So what I have found is that they are not fun when the kids are just guessing, which is again, right? So how you're going to approach these questions. So it depends on your class. It depends on where your students are. So for me, for this year, what I do is I do it like whole class discussion or a small group discussion. And I bring the question and we highlight the question and we talk about it. And then we read the questions and then we read the possibilities and we read the text. My students are enjoying the process because it's not like, okay, go and do it. Oh, you did that 30%. Mm, that's not really bad because that is doing everything but building confidence. But when you come and say, okay, what, what we understand, oh, that's awesome that you understood this and you understood that or you understood that, okay, perfect. So let's look at this question. What do you think this question is asking? And they start really getting and understanding the type of question that they're gonna be asked. Oh, that's what they meant. And you think that you don't need to be repeating this, you need to repeat this until you get blue. And I know if you're teaching whatever is the exam that you're teaching, A, B, I, P, and not, no, oh my gosh, I'm gonna re, re, reclaim what I just said. Whatever is the course that you are teaching, if you're taking an AP and an IB exam at the end, and if you have been doing this for more than two or three years, you may be saying like, oh my gosh, how they don't know. You need to remember that this is the first time for them. And you need to remember that they're 16, <clears throat> 17, or 18. So sometimes I forget and I say, oh my gosh, you just don't remember that. You don't remember that you have to justify either, either it's true or false. And they look at me like, no. And I try to open my eyes like this big, they don't. So you repeat that. So how you practice your questions will have a different effect based on your students. So if you can go back to the checklist and if you put them in group in small groups, one of the small groups that they can be with you is to practice questions that you feel they're they be they're gonna be the most challenging. And students are gonna be excited because, like Christina said, they want to be right, they want to know what to do, and when you leave them, it's gonna be so much better. Oh, we skip. <laughs> you have to tell them your favorite activities or our favorite activities, Claudia. So this is this is the favorite. These are my favorite activities. And number one is anchor charts. And the, the reason that I love anchor chart is because it really visualizes what we know. And again, we really want to work on what we know because what we don't know, we don't know. And the fact is we really cannot like pack a lot of content in the last three weeks, right? Like, I mean, how much you're gonna, we're gonna do in the last three weeks. But what we can is really just kind of recall all the things that we have learned. Now, if you do this as one student at a time, it can be frustrating because maybe the student is not going to recall too much, right? Like they may not recall anything. But if you do this in a small groups or as a class, it's super powerful. You bring a theme, you bring an unit, you can bring a uh, text types, you can bring whatever is the topic that you want to bring. And then as a class, you create an anchor chart. An anchor chart is a chart that you co-create with your students to visualize any learning that happened. In this, in this case, it's gonna to be recall any information that you have. This is how I like to do it. I like to have different big pieces of paper with different units, different themes, different topics. And I put my title really big at, at the top of my paper. And then I give sometimes, I put small groups and I give one paper with different uh, color markers to the group. And I put like a timer and I say, just dump on that paper anything that you remember about that. And I put a timer. 
and I just like don't but everything that you remember is just like just don't 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 think about it just put it there and then when the time is up then we rotate papers so when we rotate my instruction is read what the group before you wrote which is gonna be what just oh oh that's right oh yes oh that's right and then add information and then add more information and then add more information so depending on how big your class is you're going to have different number of rotations and at the end there's a great gallery walk at the end i put those posters around my class and we talk about it and you can do as much as you want to do this is great for students because it really brings up everything that you have been working on for the entire year but also as you as a teacher because then you can see the gaps then you can see oh my god they really didn't have a clue of that <laughs> oh my god they really don't even know what a block is oh my god. so at that point you can be very focused on what you are going to concentrate in the next class or two so anchor chart and they have you don't have to prepare anything you only have to have what are your topics put them on a piece of paper write it really big and that's it and the activities that you can create with those anchor charts are incredible it can be a vocab it can be like like the next one that christina is going to talk about it it can be about text types that you can do i mean you can do anything that you want depending on how you structure your classes absolutely so it really ties in well to what i have here for vocabulary brainstorms so again teaching the year two i want to make them very comfortable with testing situations so I will take a paper one, which is now the writing portion prompt, and I'll put it on a, I'll just type it out. Um, so Claudia, I think you have your own classroom, right? Yes. I do not have my own classroom. I am between two buildings and I'm in three classrooms this year. And I share with every teacher from health to math, to English, to pretty much everything. So Unfortunately for me, I don't get to like put up a lot of paper just because it's too much work for me to carry all these supplies, you know, all over the campus. And then also just taking over wall space sometimes gets a little tricky because not everyone is, you know, loves to have their walls covered with things. So I have to do it in a little bit more of a portable way. So what I do is just regular it's something I'll print out. So I'll go through old IB exams and I will pull a writing prompt, even if it's not from last year's exam. I'll go and just pull writing prompts that are either within our unit of study or sound really interesting. And I'll make it look like the new prompt where students have to choose one of three formats. I'll just make it up and make it look like that. And the first thing I always ask students to do is dissect the prompt. So highlight the words that you know, what is the theme? What do you have to do? Identify the verbs. Do you have to um, convince? Do you have to explain? Do you have to you know, analyze any of the verbs that they're going to have to do. I have them list them and basically just kind of figure out what they need to do in their writing. And then I go into the vocabulary brainstorm. So I do exactly what Claudia does with the brain dump. Okay, this writing prompt is about customs and traditions. Let's say, write down every word you know about customs and traditions, everything you know, anything you can think of, even if you don't think it has to do with this writing prompt, go write it down. And I have them work individually for usually like two or three minutes. And then I have them turn to a partner and do a little, you know, sharing for another two minutes, share out, let's compare our lists. And then as a class, we kind of come together and share. And that gives them a really solid list of words. It's a nice way to review vocabulary. It's a nice way for me to add in like, oh, remember this word, you know, without me directly having to stand up there and say, if I was doing this prompt, I would do this let them kind or guide them to it. Oh, do you remember the word for, you know, describe it like and just give them some ideas and come together as a class and share it. I think that is so powerful and so important because again, just leaning back on the test for SL students, um, I believe I have an hour and 15 minutes to write for HL students. It's an hour and 30 minutes to write one prompt. That's it. That is a long time. One hour is a long time to write, right? So for our students to have more than an hour to choose a prompt and then to write it, that's 
really generous with the time. So I tell my students, before you write, you must do this. You have to do this vocabulary brain dump. You have to do it. Because if you just read the prompt and then go into the writing, you are not going to be putting out your best piece of work because you're not coming up with some sort of draft. You need to sit there, think about it, and brain dump. And we do this, and we do this, and we do this with a bunch of different times throughout the year. That way, when it comes time for the test, immediately they go right into the brain dump. And they say, okay, I need to sit here, and I need to list every vocabulary word I know that has to do with this prompt, and it sets them up for success. So it's really powerful. Highly recommend it. And I think, and I think again, right, like, look at how much effective and efficient this is rather than, okay, we're going to practice some uh, uh, writing prompts. And you put the practice, you put the writing and say, you have one hour to go. Right? Mm -hmm. because, because then first, you are not going to have the time to read all that and give them an, a, a, like a really effective feedback. I mean, like how? Uh, and then students are going to be looking at that paper blank and like, oh, I don't think I can do this. And I, if I cannot right. do it here in class, I'm not going to do that. But you are doing the scalp falls. And it's not like, okay, so Christina remembers five words. It's like the entire class. It's like, this is what we all remember. And that is going to give uh, give us a lot of tools or give the students a lot of tools to really be able to create that at their own level. And you already like really saw where the class is when they're giving you their book up. So you really saw like, oh my gosh, they're really missing a lot of verbs or I don't believe that they, they should have more connectors. Oh, wow. And then you can give the class feedback much more effective and less work for you than any other way. I mean, I, I think this is so powerful and the, the, the time for planning is you finding the prompt and put it in the new format. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. It really doesn't take much, especially if you have access to old exams. You just copy and paste. Where it used to say, write a blog, I take out blog, I put write a text or write, you know, yeah, write an essay. I think I use write a text because that's what it says on the new ones. And then I just put blog as one of the options and I come up with two other options and it gets them familiar with it. I didn't have to come up with it from scratch. But again, like this is so important for them to practice before the exam so that they're comfortable with it. It's just something that'll give them confidence because they've seen it before, they know what to do, highly recommend it. And it's another way, like how we do this group, small groups or sharing or partners, it's another way for us to make, as Claudia said, like a boring writing interactive between students, between friends. So I definitely highly recommend it. And I think it can work for any type of um, um, task. If you're thinking about AP and if you're thinking about el correo electrónico, the email reply, then you can do exactly the same. If you're talking about cultural comparison, you can do exactly the same. Even if you are talking about a simulated conversation and you have the script, you can do exactly the same. If you have the persuasive, the argumentative essay. So it really this works for any type of task that your students have to produce language because this is going to be a great scaffold without you creating the vocab list <laughs> that they're not going to even look at it and you're going to find the papers at the end of the class on the floor and you spend i don't know how many hours trying to create the list so this is so much more effective um okay so finally games christina what are your favorite games um so i put this on here because most importantly just keep in mind, as much as we stress about our students doing well on the exam, you know, I know for me, like, especially um, this year, I'm the only teacher with the seniors. Sometimes we share um, between different teachers, but this year I have um, all the seniors. So you feel this pressure of scores reflecting on you and your performance as a teacher. I think that's very normal. I think we all feel that. Claudia and I have spoken about this before. We usually like send messages to each other over the summer. Like, did you get your scores? Oh my God, are you okay? You know, it's, it's natural. Um, it's not a reflection on our teaching. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, actually, one of my students last year, I remember he was a fabulous student, like one of my strongest students. And a lot of my students last year took the HL. They challenged the HL exam. And he, the readings were very hard last year. They were very, very hard. And he came back to class after the exam and he looked at me and he said, Senora, 
I'm just going to let you know my score, whatever I get is not a reflection on your teaching <laughs> because that test was so hard and you prepared us so well. So I'm just putting it out there. I don't want you to be upset in July. And I, I was so cute. Like he ended up, they ended up doing like very well. He did fine, but it was so cute that he said that. But with that, again, we're going back to that pressure. Like the kids have a lot of pressure on them. We have a lot of pressure on us and we feel like time, 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 time. Can't waste time. Can't waste time. They need a little bit of a break. My kids, number one, have senioritis. Nobody wants to do anything. Like they all want to just, they, they think like I'm in college. Doesn't matter. You know, here we go. Here we go with this vicious cycle of I'm in college. It doesn't matter. But then I'm in a panic about how I do on my test. It's really a vicious cycle. So we start this, but then also they have, some of them have five, six, seven exams or more, you know, if they're diploma candidates, if they're taking IB and AP exams, I mean, they're very stressed. So at some point, it's okay to like, let go a little bit and not just do test prep, test prep, test prep, test prep, play a game, take 15, 20 minutes, play a game. Like, no, they're going to be reviewing vocabulary at the end of the day. So my favorite games, my kids love Gim Kit. Um, they love Gim Kit, especially they've made some really great improvements, like some really great games. So we'll play a bunch of different ones. And my students love Look It. So that's another, those are the top two like fan favorites in my class. Um, another game that we love to play that I may, I mean, this one I have to make, so it, it is a little bit more work, but it's taboo where um, like the game taboo in English or where, if you've ever played it in your native language, you have a word or a picture. I, I, this is the way I play in class. I put a word or a picture behind the student. One student is facing the class and the other students have to describe the word or picture behind me and get me to say it in the target language. It's great circumlocution practice. It's really fun to hear them describe people, places, and things. Um, if you're going to do it, I recommend putting in like random pictures of like SpongeBob or like LeBron James and Justin Bieber and all these random things because then they really have to listen to what their classmates are saying and it makes it fun. But you can just take your vocabulary that you've focused on throughout the year or like Claudia just said, you notice a huge gap in a certain topic or a certain area of vocabulary, bring those into the games. Like the games should be where we're reinforcing what they need. Um, so that's really what I like to do. And I like to have fun because, you know, at the end of the day, yes, the test is important. Yes, our class is important, but they are students. They are still kids and they should have a little bit of fun sometimes when they deserve it. <laughs> I agree with you, Christina. And one of our favorite games, I think it's like a brain break, has become literary training. And it's so great for listening, uh, for the students, for the phonetic part, and is building so much of the vocab. And then my students are really singing. So that is something that I'm trying to do like at least once. I have 90 minutes and I'm doing 90. I'm doing it like almost every day. And we do like one song every two weeks. Because that way, at the end, is like we sing it and we compete among classes. And it's just, I love it. I mean, like I, it's like Christina said, you know, there is exam, there is something that, but at the end, there are our kids and we're, and they're going to be gone in three weeks or four weeks. And I mean, like we should be having some fun here. So yes, I love games and I love the game kit, the new game kit and booklet. Those are my students' favorite too. Um, so again, Claudia and I always come back to like, why do we just feel so overwhelmed with all of this? Why does IB feel so overwhelming all the time? Um, so first, understanding the structure of the course can be challenging. If you've gone to an IB training, you've probably left feeling overwhelmed because I've gone to two of them and you even if you've taught the course for like 10 years you go and you feel confident like yeah i've done this before and then you leave training and you're like ah, i feel like i have no idea what i'm doing because it is a lot of information i mean you get the guide who is sitting there reading through 100 pages of this guide that is packed with information that you have to know right like you have to know this you have to know what does paper one mean what does paper two mean how many writings are they doing what type of writings do they have to like you have to know all this information on top of knowing your course content, on top of knowing, you know, how to teach Spanish and knowing different themes and what activities can make it fun. And just like all of these things, plus let's throw this hundred page guide and add all these restrictions. Like it is a lot. So 
I think, I think that's challenging. I think figuring out a scope and a sequence is very challenging. Um, I've designed curriculum a few times for the IB classes and it's tough. I mean, we counted it, Claudia. Was it 19? I think it was 19 suggested yeah. subtopics are in the IB guide. 19. And even if you're teaching it, you know, for two years, you're still never going to cover 19 topics well. It's impossible. It, we don't have the time. I only get 40 minutes. I get my students five days a week, but only for 40 minutes. That's not a lot of time to get them going, get into something, and then the bell rings. So, you know, how do we make a scope and sequence that works for our district, works for our community, works for our kids? And then also the reality of our students' levels plus you know, the expectation of where they should be and how they want to score on the test. And we have to find this like happy middle ground. And it is tough because you see the IB exam and you're like, okay, I'm getting IB students. These are the advanced students. They should be at this level. And then you start the year and you're like, reality is I have some kids that are at maybe you know, a high like level two or a low level three or whatever your levels are in your school. And you're like, okay, this is different than what I expected. And that's okay. But finding that balance can be really challenging, especially on top of understanding how the exam works, understanding how the course works and figuring out a scope and sequence. And oh yeah, let's see if they could do well in the exam, like throw it all on there. So I think that's why it just feels so overwhelming. Absolutely. It's just, it's a lot. Uh, so, no, go ahead, Claudia. I was just going to say, so Claudia and I have had these conversations many times. So her and I got together uh, over the summer and we said, you know, it'd be great if we took what we do and what we know and we put it together in a comprehensible way for people who are in our situation, people who are teaching IV, SL and HL and AP and all of the things to students who maybe don't feel advanced trying to figure out a scope and sequence like let's help people let's help people and share our experiences so we sat together we planned out an entire course for you we call it overcoming the overwhelm of teaching spanish b and it's a course for ib language teachers from ib, IB. language teachers that's us <laughs> And how can this course help you? And and I think um, um, Christina said something really important. It's like we have been talking about IB and how we started, a, I don't know, 10 years ago and where we are right now and the, and the ups and downs because there have been moments where we feel like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And there have been moments where we feel like this is a disaster and how our students come at different levels every year right like every year is different i don't know if you have if you feel the same but whenever you feel like oh i got this then the the, the, the next challenge comes uh when we were feeling COVID? great oh, right. oh my students exactly. are doing well oh COVID. Exactly. Let's just take two years out of the curriculum but hey they're gonna take the same test you know exactly. yeah totally. and 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 ib will just try to make some accommodations but this year it goes like it's everything and then our students, or I don't know yours, but my students were like almost two years online. So mm -hmm. we that's why we just put this together and we decided to do it to your pace, right? So it's four modules and it's self-paced. So the self-paced means that you go on your set on your pace, and each model, module is gonna take you from understanding the text, right, in our language, in a comprehensible way, like Christina said, teachers. From teacher to teacher, from classroom teacher to classroom teacher, understanding what is what the students need to do, what is exactly the type of questions that they're going to have to answer, and then building on all these uh, sequence, a scope and sequence where students, where you can develop your own, because your students are different than mine, and my students are different than Christina, and your when we bring and we just kind of like copy paste the scope and sequence of somebody else you are going to see that it doesn't work so we want to tell you how we do it and why we do it and give you the tools so you can build your own and then we want to really focus on how can we build those receptive skills how can we get our students to really understand better and in, do the interpretation better either reading and listening 
and then we mo move to the productive skills. And those activities, those four modules is going to take you through the whole thing. So you get the strategies. And then we have been building a resource library for your support with a full vocab unit with practice, chat maths to support our output, an IA, IA oral guide and scaffolds, the Socratic seminar question starters, um, and prep worksheets and a bonus project for you. So that is a lot. It's a lot <laughs> in a good way. Yes, it's a lot. Um, so basically our goal is to help you get from, I don't know what the expectations for the IB exam are too. I have clarity of the structure of the exam and the expectations, because again, most of us have co-seeded HL and SL. It's a lot to juggle. Um, going from, I don't know how to design my scope and sequence to, I know what I'm doing. I have a plan for my two years of the course and I feel good about it. And going from what happened in the last two years, my students can't understand any of this, much less produce, to it's okay. I have strategies to meet my students where they are and help them grow so they can be successful on the IV exam. So we're going to help you get there. So with that, um, if you want to go to the next one, Claudia. Thank you. Um, we have some feedback from some people who joined us in August or September when we first opened the course. Um, and you can see these are from real IB teachers who took our course and just said it was eye-opening. It was what we needed. It, you know, a lot of them appreciated the resource library. They were able to just open and download stuff and print and go and use with their students. Um, a lot of people feedback that we got from people was I left training feeling totally overwhelmed. And after taking the course, I have a lot more clarity, which is exactly what we wanted. So that's really exciting. I'm gonna share the link in case um, you're interested in the um, comments here for anyone. And we decided to open it right now <laughs> because we uh, wanted you to have it before the test in case you wanted to like really go and look at a specific module before the test. Like, okay, I really need to work the last three weeks on this topic. But then also because we want you to have this course for May and June, so we can give you a super bonus that is, um, let me see if I can get to that. Yeah. <laughs> a summer 2022 summer camp for IB language teachers. So it's going to be a three hours workshop where we're going to have collaboration. We're going to share resources and we are going to help you to be ready for next year. So this is the time that you have May, you have June. And then in July, Christina and I will come back to you in a three hours workshop. So this is a spring bonus. This is an incredible bonus where it's three hours working with us. So you get ready for next year. And we wanted to do it last year, but last summer wasn't the right moment. Uh, and we just push it to this year. That's why we're just opening at the end. So you have some time to go look at the course, take the course, really watch the videos. If you need it twice or three times, just do the work. And then we can come back together with all this information and we can make it work for you for the next year. And uh, if you sign up before Wednesday night, you can use the spring, the code SPRING22 to get 10% off. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, Claudia and I have been talking especially about this bonus for a while. Um, and this is going to be exclusively, um, if you are if you join now, if you're part of our group, if you're part of our course, you're gonna have access to this for free, which I mean is worth its weight in gold. I've done many IB collaborations and those are some of the most helpful trainings where you just get to sit with IB teachers and say, okay, what do you do? How do you guys prepare for the IB oral? How do you guys prepare for the, you know, the writing section, the paper one? What do you do? What does it look like in class? And we can really sit and get in depth with this. So we want to do that this summer. I'm really looking forward to it. It's just nice also to connect with other people that teach the same thing because you could say, hey, like 
oh, last year, I said, hey, Claudia, what uh, book do you use? What book do you use in your course? She recommended the book Invisible to me. I used it this year. My students loved it. I'll be using it again next year if I'm teaching seniors again. So I just feel like even those little questions, just so helpful to touch base with other people and say, what are you doing? What Do you have a textbook that you like? Do you have something that you, you, you know, just those little questions that we can get together, we can collaborate. And Claudia and I are really excited to host it. And, you know, we're going to come up with some topics for discussion. We're going to come up with some strategies and tips. So we're going to leave a lot of room for us to just like collaborate and talk and share, which I think is going to be so great. Um, so definitely if you're interested, join us now. It's a great time to be with us. It's the end of the year. You'll have a lot of time over the summer to watch the videos, but you can jump into the resource library now and download everything and start using it, um, for the end of the year, whatever you need. And I think for, um, uh, for Christina, now for, I mean, I've been in IB trainings and I've been in AP trainings and I've been in a lot of conferences and I love them all, but you always have the feeling like overwhelmed, like super overwhelmed and you don't have the space. And they say, do you have questions? Like, no, I don't until you have the space to think about it. And that's when you start kind of like, oh, maybe I should do this. Maybe I shouldn't do this. What, how should I, how that should look like? And that is why these three hours workshop, we found that is such an incredible bonus because we want you to consume the course. We want you to listen to the course. We want you to learn from the course and then think about it. So when we come back in July and we meet, then it's so productive. And when you go back to your school at the end of July or August or September, then you feel like I got this. And I was talking to Christina the other day and we have this question a lot of teachers ask, well, how can you all do this? How can you teach your classes, create this? And it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time, but just the feeling that we are supporting other language teachers it's amazing. So I hope that you can get your hands into this opportunity. I hope that we can work together during the summer for this three hours live workshop. And, you know, just it's just very nice that we can, that you have a, a PD already planned for you so you can come back in July. And don't forget to use the code SPRING22 so you get 10% off. So that was it for today. I hope if you have any questions, just drop them. You know where to find Christina. You know where you can find me. If you have any questions, you can send us a direct message, shoot us an email, or just a contact, a, a tag us in a social media. Uh, I hope that you have a great week, uh, and I will see you soon. Gracias, Christina. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Bye.